Anyway, it is half past, so uh, I'll give a warm welcome to everybody who's uh, arrived so far. It's lovely to realise there are so many uh, online. Just just to explain that um, one of the reasons that we're still online is that uh, we can obviously meet in the library, but uh, we don't have the facilities then to uh, to broadcast from there very uh, very well. And so we thought it would be better if we stay on Zoom uh, this year, and uh, we'll see what happens uh, next year, uh, God willing. But let me begin by uh, introducing our speaker. A very warm welcome to uh, Dr. Robert Strivens, who's the pastor of Bradford and Avon, uh, the Baptist, the old Baptist chapel there. Um, and uh, welcome to all of you. I I'll read uh, some scripture, I'll pray, uh, and then Robert will speak. There'll be a, a short time for questions at the end. Uh, Hopefully, although uh, Robert uh, guarantees not to, to uh, answer any of those uh, questions. So let me read from uh, 2 Peter, no, 1 Peter, 1 Peter, chapter 4, and just the closing verses of uh, chapter 4, then the verses 12 to 19. Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice inasmuch as you participate in the sufferings of Christ, so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed, for the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. If you suffer, it should not be as a murderer or thief or any other kind of criminal or even as a meddler. However, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. For it is time for judgment to begin with God's household. And if it begins with us, what will the outcome be for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if it is hard for the righteous to be saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? So then. Those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do good. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we come to you tonight then and we pray that uh, this time together uh, will be blessed as we consider the suffering of your servants in ancient times and the, uh, uh, the things that uh, occurred because of that suffering. We do not know what lies ahead for us, whether you might call us to suffer uh, in the way that, uh, that they did. But we pray that uh, whether that's what's ahead for us or not, uh, that we might be instructed and our hearts might be warmed, that we might be encouraged and stirred up uh, as we consider these things. We thank you for the Evangelical Library and its uh, faithful witness these many years. We do pray that it might continue to be a tool in your hands that will help your people as they study the past and as they contemplate the future. We do commit to you uh, the library itself and the staff and uh, all who are involved. Do pray, do pray that this will be a, a blessed evening there for us then, that it might be for your glory and that uh, much good might be done. Help your servant, especially as he speaks, uh, give him uh, the ability then to, to, to get over to us then the things that. Uh, he is committed to, uh, to his heart. We pray that you will speak to us, our Heavenly Father. Amen. Amen. So, uh, without further ado, welcome, Robert. I've lost you on my screen, but I'm sure you'll appear. I am here. Uh, oh, there he is. Good. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you, Gary. Well, it's a privilege to give the annual lecture of the Evangelical Library this evening on the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre of 1572. Many of us at this lecture will be familiar with the trials and sufferings of dissenters from the Church of England during Puritan times, as well as those which followed the restoration of the monarchy in 1660. We will know of the faithful martyrs who gave their lives in the flames during the reign of Mary I in the mid 16th century. We may also be aware, though perhaps more vaguely, that around the same time across the channel, French Protestants called Huguenots were experiencing severe opposition 
and that towards the end of the 17th century, many of them were forced to flee their own country if they wanted to enjoy freedom to practice their religion. The sufferings of the Huguenots in France over that time were many and varied, but the atrocities that they underwent reached their nadir at the feast of St. Bartholomew's 450 years ago in 1572. Early on the morning of Sunday, 24th August, 1572, St. Bartholomew's Day, Admiral Gaspard de Coligny, a leading French Huguenot, was murdered in the city of Paris. Under the command of Henry, Duke of Guise, a leading Roman Catholic nobleman, a body of armed men broke into the rooms on Rue de Bétisy, where Coligny was staying, and killed those of his guards who stood in their way. Coligny, hearing the disturbance, set himself to pray, urging those with him to flee. As the murderers entered his room, he cried out to the first to approach him, young man, respect my gray hairs and old age. His plea ignored, he was struck on the head with a sword and dispatched. His body was thrown out of the window, landing at the feet of the Duke of Guise, who having identified it as indeed that of Coligny, kicked it. The corpse was then dragged through the streets of the city, mutilated, decapitated, burned, cast into the River Seine and retrieved before being hung upside down from the famous gibbet at Montfaucon on the outskirts of the city. There had been an attempt on Coligny's life two days earlier. <clears throat> he was shot from the upper floor window of a house associated with the Guise family. The shot wounded Coligny in the right hand and the left arm. He was in Paris, as were many other Huguenots, for the wedding of Henry of Navarre, the leading Protestant of the kingdom and the cousin of the young king, Charles IX, to the Roman Catholic Marguerite de Valois, the king's sister. This marriage was seen by many Huguenots as a great triumph for their cause, raising one of their own to such prominence in the nation. The more moderate on both sides of the religious divide were happy to see the union. The wedding had taken place on the 18th of August without incident, and the four days of celebrations that followed appeared to pose no threat to order in the city or to the Huguenots present. The assassination attempt on Coligny, however, understandably changed the atmosphere significantly. The Huguenots began to wonder whether all was really as it seemed, and there were calls for retribution against Catholics, in particular the Guise family, for the outrage. The attempt on Coligny's life on the 22nd seems to have been motivated by fears among the king's advisers of a Huguenot attack on the city. An apparently unfounded rumour circulated that a Huguenot army was stationed outside the city, ready to attack and to seize the king. Coligny himself had, it seems, been advocating the need for a war with Spain in support of a Huguenot attempt to assist Protestants in the Netherlands who had rebelled against Spanish rule. This was naturally strongly opposed by the Catholics. Coligny apparently underscored his views with the advice that the alternative was civil war. The court clearly felt threatened by all this. And it seems that on the night of 23rd August, the king and his mother and advisers met, and they determined that the Huguenot leaders in the city must be put to death immediately, as posing a serious and imminent threat to the security and unity of the nation. The royal order went out, and Coligny's fate was sealed. Having killed Coligny, the Duke of Guise and his men went after the remainder of Coligny's party. Count François de la Rochefoucauld and Charles de Teligny who had been staying in lodgings nearby, were killed, the latter after a, a chase across the rooftops. Others who were staying elsewhere in the city were sought out and dispatched. A group of Protestant gentlemen were staying in the royal palace at the Louvre. They were woken, taken outside, and slaughtered by the palace guards with pikes. Others were chased down and killed in the city streets and alleys. A number of Protestant gentry were staying outside the city walls in the suburb of Saint-Germain-des-Prés. The Duke of Guise turned his attention to them, though it took him longer than it should have done for him to reach them, 
as he found he did not have the right key to unlock the city gate. Once he and his men had reached the suburb, their intended victims had been alerted to the danger and some had fled. The rest were slaughtered. At some point, as dawn was breaking, the great bell of Saint-Germain l'Auxerrois at the Louvre began to toll. The second phase of the horrors of that day was about to begin. The precise order of events on that terrible morning is impossible to disentangle at this distance. The records, such as they are, are confused and self-contradictory. It seems that the tolling of the bell of Saint-Germain was taken up by other churches in the city, and that this was taken by some as the signal for some kind of more extensive action against the Huguenots. As the Duke of Guise and his men moved on from Coligny's murder, the Duke was apparently heard shouting orders to proceed with the killing of other Protestants on the orders of the King. Such a command would have reflected what is known of the royal orders to slaughter leading Huguenots in the city, but may well have been taken by the ordinary Parisian as confirmation that the king wanted Protestants generally to be attacked, and that they posed a genuine threat to the city and perhaps to the life of the king himself. These isolated events, coupled with the general suspicion, fear and hatred of the Huguenots on the part of the Roman Catholic inhabitants of Paris, built up over the previous years of hostility and fighting in the religious wars, no doubt combined to produce the terrible results that ensued. The Catholic antagonists that morning wore a cross in their hats and often a white piece of fabric tied to their sleeve or a white gown. The houses of their intended victims may also have been marked with crosses. That morning, a hawthorn bush in the cemetery of saint Innocent was observed to have flowered for the first time in several years. This was taken as a miraculous sign of divine approval of the slaughter that was to follow. It was not, however, simply an outburst of popular anger and hatred that led to the massacre. It would seem that there was some element of planning and preparation. Militia set up checkpoints in the streets throughout the city and began systematically to search houses for Protestants. Who were these armed bands and on whose orders were they acting? The king had ordered the arming of the militia, quite possibly with the intention of preserving order and preventing the slaughter spreading beyond the Huguenot leaders whom he wanted eliminated. Once the killing started, however, it proved impossible to contain. There is evidence that some of those who were armed took the opportunity to demand ransoms from the more wealthy of their victims. There was certainly a great deal of pillaging of wealthy homes. Straightforward greed seems to have been at the root of some at least of what occurred that day. This cannot be the whole explanation. It seems also that some, at least, of those responsible for the command of the citizen militia who were armed that day were particularly hostile to Protestants and may well have actively encouraged or even commanded the more general slaughter of Huguenots. The militia themselves, charged with the preservation of order in the city, may also have thought themselves obliged by the mayhem that was unfolding to act decisively against those who they may have perceived to be at the root of the disorder. No doubt the desire to loot and pillage, the effects of alcohol consumption and the thirst for blood stirred up by the violence which took over the streets of Paris that morning also contributed to the slaughter. No doubt also some took the opportunity to settle personal scores with their enemies. Mixed with the more general feelings of hostility and suspicion towards the reformed, which by this time had built up within the minds of many Roman Catholics in Paris, the murderous consequences that made up what has become known as the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre ensued. The mayhem unleashed by these various forces on the morning of the 24th of August was truly horrific. The mob had no regard for age, gender or social status. Men and women, boys and girls, the elderly, the pregnant, even infants in their cots were all legitimate targets in the eyes of those set on violence. Bodies were undressed and mutilated before or after death. Many were thrown into the River Seine. Others were thrown from windows or roofs. The streets of the city were strewn with bodies, 
and the river ran with blood. The sources evidence an extraordinary refusal of the victims of these horrors to resist. For the most part, the reformed passively accepted the sufferings which came upon them. There are accounts of Protestant men leading their households in prayer and the reading of scripture as they prepared for the fate that, the, that they knew was likely to overcome them before very long. A few saved their lives by abjuring the reformed faith and taking the cross and white sleeve of the killers. Some were saved by sympathetic Roman Catholics who took them into their houses for protection. Catholic convents in the city provided a refuge to the harassed Protestants, and even the Duke of Guise himself sheltered Huguenots in his home. The killings lasted all week before a degree of order began to be restored. The king issued orders on the 25th for the killings and lootings to stop, but these proved ineffective. There was some lull in the violence as night fell on the Monday, but it was temporary. And the killing and violence continued even after the horrors of the first few days, though more secretively and not on the same scale. It was not until the end of October that the authorities were able to re-establish something approaching a more lasting order in the city. It's difficult to ascertain with any precision how many died over that period, but an estimate of at least 2,000 and quite probably nearer 3,000 seems reasonable based on the available ev evidence. The violence was not confined to Paris, but spread to other towns and cities throughout the kingdom. The main cities where Huguenots were killed included Rouen, Orléans, Lyon, Meaux, Bourges, Saumur, Angers, La Charité, Troyes, Toulouse, and Bordeaux. In some of these cities, the victims were first imprisoned and then put to death. In others, the mob seems to have taken the initiative directly. Similar atrocities to those that had occurred in Paris were committed in these provincial towns. It appears that a considerable degree of confusion was engendered by ambiguity in the instructions emanating from the court in Paris. Although there's no evidence that the king himself ordered mass ex executions in the provinces, any more than in Paris itself, early commands from the palace indicate a fear of a potential Huguenot uprising that needed to be put down. And it could be that the more extreme Roman Catholic elements at the court were able to influence events in such a way as to encourage the slaughter. All the towns where there were killings had Roman Catholic majorities and significant Huguenot minorities. In places where Huguenots were in control, La Rochelle, Nîmes, Montauban, there was no trouble, nor where their numbers were insignificant, for example, Dijon. Again, it's difficult to ascertain how many were killed in the, in the provinces, but maybe three or four thousand, perhaps more. In total across France, it could be that close to 10,000 Huguenots lost their lives. There is much about the events surrounding St. Bartholomew's Day of 1572 that is unclear. While historians now seem to be agreed that the murder of Coligny and of other leading Protestants was carried out on orders emanating from the court, as indeed the king admitted in the orders that he issued to the provincial governors on the 28th of August, and that the more general massacre that ensued did not form part of those orders, there is no agreement about the precise role played in the events by the king, his mother, and their advisers, nor of the respective responsibility which each bore for what happened. Understandably, Huguenots at the time saw in the events a premeditated plot for their elimination. And they saw the king and the queen mother as culpable in this regard as much as their advisers. This point of view was no doubt reinforced by the fact that the king, though initially expressing horror at the massacres, later, once he realized how favorably they were viewed by many of his subjects, had coins struck to commemorate the suppression of heresy which the killings had supposedly achieved. This line of thinking was also promoted by a Roman Catholic at the papal court, Camillo Capilupi. Who, admit, who admired the supposed French royal plan to eliminate the heretics from his kingdom. Capilupi published a treatise elaborating his thesis, which the Protestants reprinted in order to prove their case. Although evidence that the more general massacres were part of a premeditated plot is lacking, the precise attribution of responsibility for the killings will perhaps never be known with certainty in this life at least.
what led to these terrible events. The Reformation in France owes its origins, humanly speaking, to the humanist interest in the scriptures that emerged in Europe in the latter part of the 15th century. In France, the work of Jacques Lefebvre de Taples to produce a new edition of the Bible and critique Roman Catholic devotion and sacramental practice prepared the ground for the reception and circulation of the reforming ideas of Martin Luther. Lutheran doctrine was condemned as heretical by the doctors of Paris University in 1521, and the king, Francis I, imposed restrictions on its teaching. There were some burnings of those accused of spreading Lutheranism. This drove the spread of Protestant teaching underground. The king was, however, sympathetic to humanist learning and therefore permitted the pursuit of biblical scholarship. The combination of the open study of the scriptures, coupled with the more clandestine circulation of Lutheran doctrine, led to the establishment of a solid Protestant work on French soil. The development and success of this movement was due in large part to the work of John Calvin in Geneva. Calvin's Institutes of the Christian Religion was published in Latin in 1536 and then in French in 1541. This and subsequent works of Calvin's pr proved immensely popular in France. By the 1540s, it was the reformed theology emanating from Geneva under the leadership of Calvin that represented the most significant section of French Protestantism. Following the pattern that they saw worked out in Geneva, French Protestants began to organize themselves into formally established churches, appoint ministers to lead them and hold regular services. 72 churches had been set up by 1559. That year saw the first national synod of reformed churches, at which most of the ministers were Gen Geneva trained. French Protestants were moving, in the words of Jef Geoffrey Treasure, in one direction, towards the foundation of a single church, accepting a common confession of faith and a common set of rules of discipline. All under the guidance and in accord with the teaching of John Calvin. 1559 also saw the death of the King Henry II, who had succeeded his father Francis I on the latter's death in 1547. Henry had been determined to protect the Catholic faith, and so life for Protestants during his reign had been difficult and often dangerous. Arrest, imprisonment, fines, even torture and exile were real possibilities for the reformed. A few suffered death by hanging or burning. In many towns and cities, Protestants met secretly. Some moved to Geneva. Henry's 15-year-old son succeeded his father to the throne as Francis II, but reigned for only 17 months, to be succeeded by his brother Charles IX, aged 10, in 1560. The consequent weakness at the centre of political power assisted the growth of the reformed movement, which saw a huge increase in the number of new churches in the land. The reformed began to be bolder and more open in their witness. Between 1555 and 1570, around 1,200 churches were planted, many of those in an extraordinary four-year period from 1559 to 1562. 220 men were sent from Geneva to pastor churches in France, and Calvin complained that he had run out of suitably qualified and trained men to send to minister in his native country. This was supplemented by vast quantities of reformed literature coming into France from Geneva. The French reformed movement thus acquired a distinctively Genevan flavour in its doctrine and practice, in its liturgy, its confessional documents, and its connectional Presbyterian system of church polity. Maybe one and a half or even two million of the total French population of around 16 to 18 million were part of the reformed movement in the mid 16th century. The movement put down deep roots across south, southern and southwestern France, with some cities, notably La Rochelle on the west coast, having majority of its population reformed. Some areas of the north and the northwest were also deeply influenced. In half a dozen towns, the mass was outlawed. The Kingdom of Navarre on the southwestern border with Spain became a Huguenot stronghold, its king regarded by many as the chief political leader of the movement. By 1560, the Reformed, who around this time seemed to have begun to be called Huguenot, 
were very conscious of their increasing strength. They were able to look back at the extraordinary growth that they had experienced over the previous 20 years or so. They began to sense that perhaps they would soon be powerful enough even to challenge the Roman Catholic character of the French kingdom. Could France as a nation become a Protestant reformed state? This sense of strength led some to action. The country was governed from 1560 by Catherine de' Medici, the mother of the 10-year-old Charles IX, who had come to the throne in that year. There was a feeling among some of the reformed that their own leader, Antoine, King of Navarre, should play a role in the regency arrangements alongside the Roman Catholic Catherine, though Antoine himself was reluctant to take up any such role. Uprisings against Roman Catholic rule were planned and plots to kidnap the king and put on trial the leading Catholic family, the Guise, were hatched. Churches began to organize their own security to defend themselves in case of trouble and the armed bands which thereby came into being were placed under the control of the church consistories. The increasing tensions between Roman Catholic and Reformed led to fears of civil war. In response, Catherine de' Medici tried various initiatives to maintain peace and place the religious character of the kingdom on a more stable basis by granting a significant degree of legitimacy to the Reformed cause. She invited leading Reformed theologians, including Theodore Beza from Geneva and Peter Marta Vermilier from Zurich, to a conference in Poissy, just west of Paris, in September 1561. They met with implacable hostility from the Roman Catholic bishops at the conference, and no progress was made. By the Edict of Saint-Germain in January 1562, Catherine granted freedom of assembly to reformed congregations, except in walled towns or at night, which served to strengthen the sense among the reformed that their cause was gaining ground, while at the same time increasing Roman Catholic concern at the growing power and influence of the Protestants. The result was civil war. On the 1st of March, 1562, soldiers under the command of Francis, Duke of Guise, father of the man responsible for Coligny's murder, encountered about 300 Protestants who were worshipping in a barn in the town of Boissy in northeastern France. <clears throat> they were commanded to disperse. What happened next is impossible to recover, but the outcome was that the soldiers opened fire and about 50 worshippers died. Guise received a hero's welcome on his arrival in Paris following the killing. The king and his mother were taken from their palace in Fontainebleau to Paris for their protection, an act which convinced the reformed that it was finally time to resort to arms. The French wars of religion had begun. In the fighting that followed, Protestant forces initially took the leading cities of Lyon Orléans and Rouen, along with significant towns such as Tours, Le Havre, Grenoble, Vienne, Nîmes, Montpellier and Dieppe. There were many instances of iconoclasm, looting of church treasures and destruction of relics and other accoutrements of Roman Catholic worship. For the most part, however, the Huguenots were unable to hold on to these gains and were soon overcome by superior Roman Catholic numbers. Hostilities were brought to an end after 11 months of fighting by the Peace of Amboise. The reformed were restricted to specific cities and regions of the country where they were numerically strong and where the no nobility was predominantly Protestant. Tensions remained, however, and civil war broke out again in 1567 and in 1568. Atrocities were committed by both sides. In Tours, in 1562, Protestants were massacred in the church in which they had taken refuge and their bodies were thrown into the Loire. At Michaelmas in 1567, nearly 40 Catholics were captured and brutally killed by Protestants in Nîmes. On the whole, after their first successes, the Huguenots were the underdogs, numerically inferior, politically and militarily weaker, in a land dominated by the culture and customs of historic Roman Catholicism, which regarded them as little different from outlaws and renegades. The Protestant minority was, at the same time, not so weak that the dominant Catholics could finally subdue and overcome them. 
In the Southwest, particularly, the reformed were dominant under the determined leadership of the redoubtable Jean, Jean, Jean d'Albret, mother of the future King of France, Henry IV. So tensions continued to flare and civil war continued to break out. And it was these tensions which manifested themselves in such a barbaric manner on St. Bartholomew's Day in 1572. In one sense, the terrible events of that St. Bartholomew's Day can be seen simply as the worst atrocity of the nine civil wars that France underwent between 1562 and the Edict of Nantes in 1598. But the numbers killed, the intensity of the killings, and the extent and geographical spread of the towns affected mean that the massacres of 1572 stand apart, even among the other horrors of the civil wars of that time. The question arises, therefore, as to how and why such a dreadful event or series of events could have occurred. It is possible to identify a number of factors which contributed to make that awful occasion possible. These may be examined under four heads. Firstly, there was a clear and undeniably political angle to the Huguenot movement. It had attracted to its cause a not insignificant number of the nobility and other high-ranking members of French society. The interest of some of these, no doubt, was primarily spiritual, but for others, it was more of a political move. They saw the Huguenot cause as one that they could use for the advancement of their own power over against that of the king and his Roman Catholic supporters. This was coupled with a more general sense in the movement that they were gaining more and more influence in the nation and that France could perhaps even become a Protestant state. The nobility in France were powerful in their own right, especially when the king was weak, as was the case in the years leading up to the massacre in 1572. Leading noblemen had their own armies, which could be used to reinforce power in their own territory, but also to seek to enforce their will on other nobles or even on the royal court. Secondly, there was growing concern on the part of the Huguenot movement even more broadly that the Roman Catholic noble family of the Guise, who were the implacable enemies of the Huguenots, were taking over the French state following the death of Henry II in 1559. There was an increasing sense on the Huguenot side that political and military action would be necessary to protect their cause. This was perhaps strengthened by Calvin's view that rebellion led by the nobility against tyranny was legitimate. This sense led in 1560 to a failed attempt by the Huguenots to attack the palace of Amboise where the royal family was staying. The aim was to kidnap the king and dislodge the Guise from power, though in the popular eye, it looked like an attempt on the king's life. Coupled with this was Protestant iconoclasm, which played a distinctive role in the wars of religion. The destruction of Roman Catholic images, statues, on occasion, even church buildings, the desecration of the host at mass and attacks on the persons of priests and bishops, as well as the disruption of religious processions and the denigrating of Roman Catholic ritual and observances. Huguenot sentiment in the years from 60, 1560 onwards was markedly anti-Catholic. Thirdly, there was the state of the king and his court. The youth of Francis II and then Charles IX and the regency arrangements that this necessitated inevitably weakened the throne and led to some degree of instability in a kingdom that depended for its unity largely upon the person of the king. Traditionally, the king was charged with the duty to uphold the Roman Catholic religion and suppress heresy. The regency arrangements in place made it impossible to do this, at least to the satisfaction of many Roman Catholic noblemen and others. At the same time, Charles IX clearly feared the power of the Huguenots and the threat to his kingdom that they represented. He would have felt the need for some decisive action to be taken to stem their influence and strengthen his position. Then fourthly, there was the popular fear of and hatred for the Huguenots on the part of many ordinary Roman Catholics in France. They would have seen the growth in the strength and organization of the movement, the Huguenot connections with the foreign city of Geneva would have fermented suspicion. Protestant iconoclasm would have been perceived as a threat to property, as well as an attack on the nation and its religion. 
Popular bodies for the protection of the Roman Catholic faith were formed in towns and cities across France. In some more extreme cases, preparations were made for violent action to defend the church and destroy the heretics. In Paris, as in other towns and cities, the identity of the Huguenot residents would have been known to their Roman Catholic neighbors. Tensions within a city or town would have been running high. And once violence broke out, it would not have been difficult for the enemy to have been identified and targeted. Instability at the royal center, members of the nobility jostling for power and fear, hatred and emergent, emergent, sorry, members of the nobility jostling for power and fear, hatred and emerging violence at the popular level, all combined with the increasing sense of polarization and hostility between Huguenot and Roman Catholic to make Paris a virtual tinderbox on that fate, fateful night of St. Bartholomew's in 1572. The explosive mi mixture was lit by the decisions of the Royal Court and the assassination of Coligny, which in turn led to the conflagration that engulfed Paris and the nation for the few terrible days that followed. Civil war continued off and on after the massacres for a further quarter of a century. Attitudes hardened. The Huguenots lost all confidence in Catherine as a potential peacemaker with any concern for their interests. The Catholics viewed the Huguenots even more firmly as the enemy. The Huguenot cause saw considerable decline and the status of France as a Roman Catholic country was consolidated. Huguenot resistance was stiffened by the development of a more worked out doctrine of resistance to tyranny, encouraged by the publica publication of François Ottmann's Franco Gallia and by Beza's teaching that inferior magistrates had a duty to overthrow a tyrant who opposed God and the true faith. The status of the south and west of France as a Huguenot stronghold was reinforced through its army and the development of agreements with other Protestant powers internationally. In effect, it became in some respects a state within a state with its own constitution providing for civil government, a network of courts, military power, and a system of finance. In 1584, <clears throat> the unexpected death of Francis, Duke of Anjou, the King's brother, made the Protestant Henry of Navarre, who had been the bridegroom on that fateful day in 1572, the heir to the French throne. This was fiercely contested from the Catholic side, who put forward a rival candidate. Henry's military skills and overall experience of government, however, played in his favour, as did the Pope's unwise intervention on behalf of the Catholic candidate. Then, on the 1st of August, 1589, a young priest, a member of the hardline Catholic League, assassinated the King, Henry III, by stabbing him in the stomach. The League believed the court to have been insufficiently fervent in their adherence to Roman Catholic ways and the pursuit of heretics. The irony, of course, is that the death of Henry III left the throne to a Protestant successor, Henry of Navarre. Huguenot hopes for a Protestant France were dashed, however, when their champion was eventually compelled to abjure his Protestantism and was received into the Roman Catholic Church in order to secure the capital. Paris is worth a mass, as Henry may or may not have said. He was finally crowned king in February 1594. All was not entirely lost for the Huguenot cause, however, for in April 1598, Henry proclaimed the famous Edict of Nantes, providing for freedom of conscience and allowing Huguenots access to public office and education at all levels. Huguenot worship was permitted in those towns and cities that had been under Huguenot control in August 1597, in the homes of Huguenot nobility, and in two places in each administrative region. Roman Catholic worship was to be permitted anywhere in the nation. Only Roman Catholic wedding rites were permitted, and Roman Catholic holidays and feast days were to be observed by all citizens and tithes were to be paid. Huguenot writings were subject to censorship and were not to be sold outside Huguenot controlled areas. Crucially, the Huguenots were permitted to maintain an army and defend their towns. The census conducted by the Huguenots in 1598 found 759 Huguenot churches and around 800 Huguenot ministers. 
The total number of Huguenots seems to have, been, seems to have revived by this time to just above the one million mark. From the high point of the 1560s, however, less than 40 years earlier, when they may have reached double that number and accounted for up to 10% of the French population, it was a severe reverse. The wars of religion proved to be very damaging for the Huguenot movement as a whole, at least as a social and political phenomenon. The massacres of St. Bartholomew's Day, 1572, were a disaster from which French Protestantism has never fully recovered. Let me close by mentioning four areas in which we can, I believe, learn lessons from the events that I have sought to describe. Firstly, some of the opposition that the Huguenots of the 16th century experienced can undoubtedly be ascribed to the political edge that that movement acquired. The manner in which some of the Protestant nobility of France used their religious affiliation to seek the advance of their political ambitions certainly contributed to the vehemence of the opposition shown to them by those loyal to the Roman Catholic Church. The ordinary people, to whom their religion may have had a more personal and spiritual significance, were often the ones to suffer. The dangers for Christians, particularly those who may have more influence in the nation at a social or political level of seeking advance through political means or for political ends, are clear. Secondly, at the same time, the experience of the Huguenots shows up very clearly the complexity of the relationship between religion and politics. At that time in French history, to take up a religion that was not Roman Catholic was to set oneself apart in a significant way from what it meant to be truly French in the eyes of many. To be or to become a Huguenot may very often have been a straightforward demonstration of genuine spiritual experience. But for the royal, loyal Roman Catholic French, it would have been understood as a hostile, cultural, political, or even military statement. As Huguenots sought to defend themselves, their families and property, their religion and culture from such hostility, through military organization and defense of their own, politics and religion, however sincere, inevitably became entwined. In this fallen world, such an outcome may be inevitable but it compels us to think perhaps more carefully than we have done about the relationship that we have with our own society, culture and politics and with the government of the day. Thirdly, the Huguenot experience challenges the popular idea that the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church, as Tertullian is supposed to have said. Persecution does not always lead to church growth. For the Huguenots of France in the 16th century, it had the opposite effect leading to a substantial decrease in their numbers and influence. Although some relief was obtained at the end of the century by the Edict of Nantes, the regime that was thereby introduced did not give them complete liberty of religion. And by the end of the following century, with the revocation of the Edict by Louis XIV in 1685, Huguenots in France had all but been eliminated, either forced into exile or killed. Biblical Protestantism in France today is extremely small in number, and of almost no influence on society as a whole. Fourth, and finally, among all, among all these difficult and perhaps intractable questions, let us not forget the faithful believers who suffered, many of whom died on St. Bartholomew's Day, 1572, and the dreadful days that followed. Charlotte d'Arbaleste, a 22-year-old widow and faithful Huguenot, had come to Paris on business, and found herself caught up in those terrible events. One of her servants came to tell her early that Sunday morning that they were killing everyone. She left the house where she was staying. Shortly after, at around eight o'clock, some servants of the Guise came to the house and ransacked it. Charlotte, with her three-year-old daughter, took refuge with a relation of hers, Monsieur de Perreux, a magistrate. There were other Huguenots whom Monsieur de Perreuse had taken into his home, eventually totaling more than 40. He and his wife took turns to stand outside their front door, exchanging pleasantries with Guise and other Catholic noblemen who passed by. Eventually, on Tuesday, the house was searched. Let us hear Charlotte as she takes up the story. Most of those who had taken shelter there left to go elsewhere. 
Only Mademoiselle de Chauffreau and I remained. We had to be hidden. She with a servant in a woodshed behind the house, one of my servants and me in a hollow roof vault. <clears throat> the rest of our servants disguised and hid themselves as best they could. From this hollow vault high in the attic, I heard such strange cries of men, women and children being killed in the streets below that I was unable to think clearly and was almost in despair. Had I not feared offending God, I almost would have preferred to jump to my death than to fall alive into the hands of the populace, or to see my daughter, whom I'd left below, killed, which I feared more than my own death. At this stage, Charlotte's daughter was successfully transferred into the care of her grandmother. Charlotte had to disguise herself and escape to a different location in the city, the home of a blacksmith. And over the following days, she moved from one safe house to another as the killings and lootings continued. Eleven days after the start of the massacre, Charlotte managed to escape by boat down the Seine and eventually reached Sedan in the Ardennes, at that time a sovereign principality and a popular refuge for escaping Protestants. Her ordeal was over and she was still alive. For many thousands of others, there was no such escape. Their ordeal brought them, we trust, directly into the immediate presence of their Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Should we be called upon to bear witness to our Saviour in such circumstances in our day, may we be found likewise faithful. Thank you very much, uh, Robert. That was uh, fascinating. And, uh, yeah, it's good to hear. So, as I said at the beginning, there is uh, a little opportunity for uh, questions. So, if anybody's uh, got any questions, please uh, take that opportunity. Oh, this is Malcolm Maguire from Bridport. Good evening. Welcome, Mal Malcolm. Thank you. Uh, what's your question? Um, do we know how many escaped or were able to leave France to Britain or other countries of the Huguenots? Um, at St. Barthol on St. Bartholomew's Day, 1572, there wasn't a lot of... Um, that wasn't the great sort of exile to other countries that, that happened about 100 years later after the revocation of the Edith, Edith Nantes. But, but some, I think, did, yes. Um, there was considerable contact between the Huguenots and not only Geneva, but uh, the German Protestants and English as well. Canada. I'm sure some did escape to England, but uh, not on the scale that happened, say, 100 years later. Oh, oh thank you very much. Thank you. So, um, Robert, um, why did um, the Huguenots, the Protestants, resist so little at the time of the massacre when they, from the way you filled it in, the background, they'd obviously been so active politically and militarily? Yeah, that's a very good question, Esther. Um, I don't know the answer. I can guess. I can, I can have a guess. Um, I think there were clearly, there were Huguenots who were more politically minded and there were Huguenots who were more spiritually minded. Um, and it may well be that those who were, were massacred, who didn't resist, were more the more spiritually minded. Um, stories of them praying, heads of households leading in prayer, reading the scriptures, knowing what was coming would indicate that. Um, And, and they were probably unprepared. Um, I don't suppose they were armed. They couldn't get together. Uh, they, were, they were being taken individually or in families. Um, that must have been another factor as well. But, but it's a good question. Just to comment, and, and that is Michael Payton from Chippenham, just to say that last week in the Trooping of the Colour, there was a Huguenot influence because... The first music played by the masked bands was by a French composer, Meyerbeer, called the Huguenots. Mm. And halfway through the march, the, the bands played uh, a few bars from Mendelssohn's Reformation Symphony. Mm. Very good. Thank you, Michael. 
Actually, on that question, Robert, uh, you made that point that the um, <coughs> persecution doesn't always lead then to growth. Um, clearly, it was uh, uh, a bad day for France. And uh, as far as France is concerned, then uh, Protestantism was in decline from at least that point. But then if you take it globally, I, I know that's a much more difficult thing to do, but could a case be established that it did lead to growth or, or would you... Through, um, through moving to other countries and that sort of thing. Yeah, I'm thinking yeah. of the influence, of, particularly in this country, but I think yeah. it's true in other, one or two yeah. other countries as well. Um, yes, when we were in South Africa, there's a you know, hmm. monument and movement there, uh, uh, museum there, um, and other parts of Europe. Yes, I'm sure that's true, that, that we benefited hugely from, from that exodus at the end of the 17th century and, and probably before that. But it's, well, those there are one or two listening who have much more knowledge of France than I do, but it, I find it's always tragic. You go to France, you hear about this wonderful movement, the influence of Geneva and Calvin and so on. And, and well, today, many reformed churches seem to be liberal. Uh, the numbers of real reformed evangelicals have, seem to be very small. Um, though perhaps growing, uh, we can pray for that. But it seems to me to be a tragedy and the, the judgment of God upon that nation ever since, it would seem to me. But those, Michael might be able to comment, or Alan better than me on that. Can I make, sure. sorry, can I make a comment, Malcolm Maguire from Bridport? Uh, we served in Marseille for 10 years and we know Michael well. And Whenever the morning service came up of the um, the reformed, it was black, the churches, there was nothing of interest. Once they went over to the Catholics, mm. there was children taking gifts up to the altar. There were families. And it, it just well, not broke my heart, but I thought something has gone wrong. <laughs> yeah. yeah, sorry. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Y yes, of course, the um, persecution in North Africa led to the extinction almost of the of the church in North Africa. Of course, yeah. it was a very vibrant church beforehand. But we were missionaries in North Africa for 20 years. And today what is happening is in spite of the persecution, and I think also because of the severity and the harshness of some Muslim governments, people are becoming disillusioned and open to hear the gospel and there is remarkable growth today. I know there are problems, but we, when we left Algeria in 82, it was reckoned then there were uh, just 2,000, oh, sorry, two, just 200 Christians of Muslim background then. And today the figure is about 100,000. And likewise in Morocco, when we left Morocco, about 500 Christians there today. No one knows, several thousand today. And that is in spite of the persecution. I'm back to a, a comment. It's reputed that Voltaire, the philosopher, said that the St. Bartholomew massacre was the greatest disaster ever to befall France. And concerning the exiles, um, in 1600, one third of the population of Canterbury were strangers. Now, of course, some of them would have been balloons but undoubtedly some of them would have been Huguenots from France. Yeah, that shows the extent of it, doesn't it? Yeah. And of course, there would be many more um, after 1685. Well, great. Uh, there's no, I don't think there's any other questions. Well, I, I just had a quick oh, one. On, what stage of the Camisage? Um, uh, you caught me out, John. I, I, I put everything. I practically everything I knew went into the paper. So beyond that, I'm, I'm, I'm ignorant. <laughs> Sorry. Others may be up. Norman may be able to answer that later. Um, so um, coming back to you, Robert. May I ask uh, your sources? Obviously, Jeffrey Treasure. I heard yeah, him speak. Uh, yeah, I heard you speak locally because we got the Huguenot Museum in Rochester. Oh yeah. I was going to, if I may, Gary, just mention one yes, or two yes. books that people. So there's this book, which is by Geoffrey Treasure, called The Huguenots, 
uh, it's, a, it's just a, a very straightforward, fairly detailed account of the Huguenots from beginning to end, well, you know, go, going up quite a long way uh, past the revocation of the Edict of Nantes. So um, that's an excellent account. Um, on the wars of religion, French wars of religion, this book by R.J. Knecht, K-N-E-C-K-T, T-H-T, um, just called The French Wars of Religion, is very, very helpful, factual. Um, and there's a little book by Barbara Diefendorf called The St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre with some original source material appended to it as well. So, um, And there's just one by, uh, by Henri Nor Norgoose, but I can't pronounce his surname. Oh, yes, yeah, I've not come across that. Is that good? Yeah, helpful. But not well, as thank you. not well summarised like you, though. <laughs> thank you, uh, thank you for that. Well, thank you. Let me thank you again, uh, Robert, for uh, sharing with us like that. It's been a, a, a great blessing. Um, the the lecture is recorded, um, and I, I do hope that uh, it will appear in text form in the uh, in the library magazine in writing. Uh, in the near future, so do look out for those things. Um, I let me see now. Uh, it's nice to have uh, Alan Davy with us uh, from Bordeaux. I don't know, Alan, Alan, if you'd be willing to just uh, close in prayer for us. Uh, it's nice to have you with us. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, Heavenly Father, we thank you that um, uh, although the history of your people uh, is um, marked by periods of great difficulty and opposition, uh, also by our own failure and our own uh, sinfulness. Uh, we thank you that um, we know that uh, the story of your people is the story of the winning for the Lamb of the fruits of his, his work. And we, we uh, ask you then to bless uh, the nations of uh, the UK, but also of France, uh, with the preaching of your words so that uh, people may find um, eternal life through the Lord Jesus Christ and uh, that um, our countries may be changed by the power of the gospel. Please help, we pray. Uh, help us to learn lessons that are important um, about um, how we approach public life. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that you would make us, uh, have a, uh, give us that, that um blend of wisdom uh, and of tact, but also of boldness and of courage that we need in order to be your witnesses in these uh, complicated and difficult days. Uh, we thank you again for what we've heard this evening. Pray that you would um, uh, use all uh, th that we might grow in wisdom and in likeness to the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Well, thank you, everybody, for... Uh attending it's uh, it's been great to uh, can't see all of you but to see some of you anyway and uh, thank you for tuning in thank you good night